Bob Dylan toured Europe in the early summer of 1966. The tour attracted controversy. The first half of the show was a solo acoustic set, which was well received. The second half was an electric set with Bob backed by the Hawks. It left many of his folk fans angry. He played Manchester's Free Trade Hall on the 17th of May. This was the infamous Judas concert captured on Columbia's Dylan's Bootleg 4 and Scorsese's No Direction Home documentary. The following is the authentic voices of three people who were in the audience that night. C.P. Lee, who has written the definitive account of the show, like The Night Revisited. Mark Macon, who took photos on the night. And Mike Bowden, who was in the hostile folk purist section of the crowd. About a week before I'd seen the Dublin review in Melody Maker where it was uh, um, get rid of the stuffed gollywog I think was one of the bits on it um, but other than that there was there was nothing in the national press or buzz word of mouth going about was there? Not about not about it being any different than a Dylan concert I mean it was just a Dylan concert I remember seeing something in that I didn't remember it was a, a Dublin concert but seeing it in the Melody Maker and half thinking it was probably just a one-off experiment. He won't be doing that in Manchester. Mm -hmm. no. It's a Hyman Addison, which used to be across the road from here, where you yeah. bought the tickets. Yeah. One yeah. outlet with a handwritten note in the yeah. window yeah. for this. Yeah, yeah. And two thousand seats sold in like a day or something. A friend of mine saw him in Belfast and said that they, they actually were in the theatre while they were doing a sound check, and that Dylan was asleep, curled up. And he said, and then Dylan woke up to find this guy sketching it because he was at art school. And he said he unfolded himself like a spider and, and peered up at him and said, Who the hell are you? And he said, I'm just, I'm an artist. And said, okay. And then curls back again and goes to sleep. <laughs> uh, There's a, a great bit of footage in um, Don't Look Back where they're opening the doors of the Albert Hall. And in those days, they did keep them shut, didn't they? Until yeah. 7.15 or whatever. And it, I, I vaguely recalled the doors here opening and people rushing into their seats. There wasn't that much milling around in the lobby. I'm sure that people... Had been no, it was, a, fran it was a frantic rush yeah. at yeah. the end of it. Yeah. Right. Even though we had right. numbered seats, it was, uh, yeah, it was let's get there before yeah. somebody sees yeah. them. And then, looking at the stage, it seemed the big massive well, it was just laid out wasn't yeah it, the whole thing drunk in very stark white light as well it was a yeah. very clean it was the sort of light all the way through the concert that you just wouldn't get today there'd be so much emphasis on color and showmanship and fades yeah. and everything else and this was just stark white light from yeah. beginning to end really wasn't it Oh, was there even a blackout before he came on? <coughs> oh, the, the, the house lights dimmed. The house lights dimmed, dimmed, definitely. And then that will he, won't he, will he, won't he, and then this tiny spider comes up <laughs> with cotton wool hair, which is, to me looks orange. Mm. Uh, and for some reason, I'd always expected Dylan to have black curly hair, but no, it's this orangey brown hair, it seemed, in the light. And um, he's on his own with an acoustic guitar, and there's almost a perceptible sigh of relief exactly, in the yeah. crowd. Total sigh of relief, mm. including myself, yeah. 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 Including me, I thought that. I thought, God, oh, great. It's just Dylan. And, and you got Dylan, and we yeah. got Dylan, mm. didn't we? And it was oh, yeah. an astonishing 45 minutes. Mm. But how did you feel as, um, a, let's say, a protest fan, going along and there's Dylan, and Dylan is not doing Blowing in the Wind, or Hattie Carroll. Well, what did he think of the acoustics? Then? Yeah, I loved it because he already uh, I'd heard lots of recordings that were you know things from Mr. Tambourine Man onwards that were that were I mean and even in the earlier stuff, um, Dylan's love songs are always sort of not talked about enough really, and the sheer poetry of everything was absolutely beautiful and it was Dylan it was the charisma of Dylan it was the the symbol of Dylan and who he was and he was there on his own but Bob Dylan was very much a singular creature you know he was there he yeah. was the you know the, the spokesman of a generation or whatever yeah. um, 
And so that was very important. Well, we were getting him in exactly the way that all the images had been, which is the sharp spotlight, and there he is on the screen. In the way he was, in the way we knew him to be, and sort of a, a lone voice standing up for us. The word or the metaphor cathedral has been banded about a lot, but it's the only thing I can I, think yeah, of. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Think I think that first the closest you get. That yeah. first set was exactly that same reverential attitude, yeah. wasn't it? That you would but an American that I know criticised said, "Why didn't you guys applaud when you at the beginning of every number?" And I said, "So well, well, we didn't do it. that." <laughs> you might, you might can, also, we don't know what we're applauding <laughs> after that because this is brand new stuff to yeah. us, mm. um, and it's going to be some months before we hear it. But that's a changed attitude now. That whole that yeah. whole thing that we now yeah. take for granted is first few bars, everybody applauding in recognition. Yeah. Yeah. It could have happened with three or four numbers, but it wasn't done. No, you didn't. In the same that. way the building wasn't used. Everything about this was a unique one off mm. first attempt at what now has set the standard. numbers. There's business going on in the first set, isn't there? there Which is. don't, doesn't quite come over on the CDs. I think they've edited them a bit. Um, but Fiddling, what was well, he, he doing? Was a, I think he was, he was fiddling. I think he was fiddling basically all the time between every number. He'd got at least half a dozen harmonicas sitting on top of the stool with the glass of water in the middle, which he managed to avoid. But what, what, once the performer avoid has got an audience like that in the palm of his hand, then it doesn't matter. You are, you know, if he asked you, you were, to invade Poland, you'd have gone. <laughs> you know, there'd have been no two ways about it. So every little thing he did, it, it's not fiddling, it's all part of the it fantastic was, experience. Yeah. But you've done something which you've got there, a camera, and you've been mm. taking pictures all night. Now this is not digital download. No. How long did it take for them to be developed? And how did you do it? It was dead easy. It was an Agfa Silet Rapid camera, little couple rangefinder thing. The sort everybody took on holiday with the drop down front off your leather cap, you know, oh, right, the yeah. little brown thing. Wasn't it? And I thought I knew enough about, I was at, what was I doing? I was just leaving sixth form grammar school with a view to going to art college. So I knew about the basics of photography. The answer to taking a picture was let's get a fast film. So we put Ilford HP4 film in it. We didn't think we, we dare use a flash. We didn't know why, because nobody had ever, it, it wasn't, there wasn't a comment about, you're not allowed no. to take pictures. No, you didn't cross it. But I didn't yeah, think we really wanted did. to draw attention well, well, to ourselves. So yeah. we just said, well, okay, let's just, let's put these in and see what we get. And we were so close. The only reason the, the pictures happened with the success that they did is because I was in his, in his space, basically. I was in his spotlight. Mm. You can't get any closer than that. And I didn't need any light whatsoever. The result being is that the pictures have got a graininess to them that you would get from a 400 ASA film mm. whacked up to whatever the speed was I was using. I remember lying in front of the gas fire going through these things and looking at them. And of course we had no large images. These were contact size 36 millimeters, so we couldn't really see anything. Well, obviously we'd got a lot of pictures of a guy singing with his arms in the air and two mm. of them together. We knew we'd got the whole concert on it. As it turned out, our success rate wasn't wasn't actually colossal. I'd got I'd managed to get what you would call fifteen. I suppose it's no different to any photographer today from a, a wasted mm. role or what he thinks he can get away with, what he thinks he's succeeded with. But I got twenty shots that were usable. Another twenty shots are perfectly crisp and perfectly workable that nobody's ever seen. But there's a microphone up his nose or there's something yeah. else in the oh, yeah. So yeah. they're not the images you would select for anything. Um, the 20 that we took have, have been well catalogued and published. There's a further set because he was moving around in such an animated sort of way with Robbie that just as you clicked it he'd turn. So we've got blurs, we've got all the other stuff that you've got on it, but there are 72 images out of that that mm -hmm. exist. But then came the interval and the light that Dylan's gone, the house lights come up. And I, I can remember people around me going like, well, thank goodness he didn't play with the band. He's seen sense. Um, and that palpable air of uh, reverence and uh, relief was permeating the hall. I mean, how did you feel in the intermission? The equipment was there. So it was obvious it was going to be used at some point or other. But the first half was so good that exact, exactly like that. Well, maybe he won't. 
maybe in the second the first half's gone so well he'll say to his band i don't need you yeah, and i'll yeah. just go i'll yeah. just come back and do the second half to say i'm very naive but that's it i was naive i think i was just so close uh, to all this equipment i thought it's got to be used it was all in my face the whole time When the house lights go down and the, then you hear that uh, English country garden or whatever on the organ and you realise there are now these people looking to us um, or, or looking to me so hackneyed in uh, different coloured velvet yeah, suits yeah. which was, this was out now. Looking like British. a pop group. Yeah. Just like Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat was the, the song that did it for me because I thought he, I, I almost saw it on a, a level of itsy witsy teeny weedy yellow polka dot bikini because it was. Right, yeah. he, I thought, yeah. what is this it's not nonsense? Not a throwaway nature. You know, yeah, yeah, it was throwaway. It was, and I thought, yeah. this is what Dylan's becoming. He's becoming a pop singer, and it's, you know, you can't take me this far and then uh, leave me. You know, Dylan has interrupted us. No, thank you very much. <laughs> I remember the on. when yeah, you moved yeah. into the electric half. I remember. I remember the, the the descent, if you like, was a definite build. Yeah. I I don't think there was much. As you say, I think there was a stunned reaction after Tell Me Mama. By the time we'd gone through the second and third, there was a bit of descent. Like it's about time. It only started to crystallise into something where we need to do something about this as an audience against the band. By the time we got to Ballad of a Thin Man, because. Um, Dylan took over the piano players jobs and Richard Manuel had to walk off the stage and I remember everybody clapping as if to say we've got rid of we've one, got rid of one. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was a build from there on in I remember so it was really the chaos when I started to get edgy and thinking I wish people had stopped this I just want to watch yeah. Dylan I was we were in the last three songs by that time <laughs> do you remember Barbara walking up with the note yes yeah. I'm not sure now. I do. Yes. No, I thought I thought about that a lot since uh, since you brought that to everyone's. Uh, I think. Barbara's note said, "Send the band back home." It, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So even she was prepared to forgive Bob. Yes. But all he had to do was get rid of the band. And Dylan taking the note, reading it, putting it in his pocket, and bowing very yeah. nicely to her. I think he blew her a kiss. Yeah, well. I don't remember that. And, uh, he then carries on. But I, I just love that indefatigable spirit of. Uh, yeah. The present day artist. The self yeah. self belief. Yeah. 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 It's become part of that same mythology about Newport, uh, where people booed and they weren't booing Dylan, they were booing the sound. Mm. And I think that Yeah, being somebody who was completely and utterly into acoustic music and not yeah. electric music, any sort of feedback was mm. was wrong and that's something to me. And and I distinctly remember as they plug in there'd be a bit of feedback. There was definitely something came from the organ and Sort of didn't belong there, and that was the first. But my first feeling was, oh no! I can't imagine you wouldn't have oh, feel no. like in a place like that. To be honest. Yeah. Then we reached like the penultimate, which is uh, Dylan moves to the piano. Uh, <laughs> we've had the slow, We've had a few shouts. That's I think um, the, there's one which there's a big argument about what's actually. Where's your silver? I think is what someone says. Which is, about being Judas, which is going to come later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you get Ballad of a Thin Man, and then there's the switch over when he goes back to electric guitar, and everybody's getting ready. The slow hand clapping is built up into uh, a formidable uh, crescendo of slow hand clapping. And does that piece out? And then somebody shouts out Judas. It's, and then, and then somebody shouts back. Yeah, they, well, I, I think they cottoned on about five or six numbers in that the slow hand clap should be obligatory at the end of everything. Yeah, but then the other side of it, and this is kind of a Minnesotan trait in Dylan, perhaps, or a Hibbing trait, is his indefatigable stubbornness. And we know that the, the stories about when he was at high school and he's playing Little Richard on the piano at the high school, um, and the the head of the high school pulls out the plug on the amps, but Dylan keeps pounding away, and it's a talent competition, and half the audience are for Dylan, the other half are against or Zimmerman, and the other half are against Zimmerman, and this booing goes on, a crescendo of booing, um, which I, they actually became a working jobbing band in, in the area, 
um, without any further trouble. But at that high school thing, there, there were people with performing dogs and juggling and this, that and the other. And it was, I, I think it's noted as the very first confrontation with Dylan and an audience. And he doesn't let go, he doesn't give up. He just, straight through to the end when he finishes. We've all been asked, when do you remember the Judas shout? And I, for one, don't, I remember all the chaos and the confusion and the shouts, etc. but I don't specifically remember Judas. No, can, and you've said yourself, you don't I can remember, remember shouting, but, but shouting. Judas. And we've all sort of avoided the Judas thing. I, I remember and yet, and that Judas. Was, that's become the linchpin that, that yeah. pins that concept down. I remember somebody shouting Judas because it made me laugh. I thought it was funny. And I thought it was a, right. a funny you thing to that. say. It yeah. was a joke. Yeah, yeah right. Right. Yeah. So we have a definitive. So there's a definitive. Yeah. yeah. But that inviting um, controversy yeah, uh, yeah. And, and being steadfast and resolute in the face of that controversy yeah. and not caring that people are booing um, and just pounding away um, until yeah. you've finished. You don't give an inch, no quarter asked, no, no quarter no. given. No. Thinking back, I don't recall that anybody paid much attention to it. It virtually died after about two or three days. It didn't, the, the, the acclaim that we're giving it now was just a damp squib after the concert. I don't recall people, other than the people who went, you know, lyrically looking back and trying to recall what you'd seen and me looking at my photographs. I lived in my own little world with that concert for years after that. Um, it's only after, the, the bootleg appeared about 1970, I think, was the first time that concert was heard again, or parts of it. Yeah, um, and it was yeah. attributed, it had that daft label, didn't it, which was Royal Records yeah. with a performer called Albert Hall. Mm. And so ever since, it was it was thought to be that. Um, I, the, my mem concert, memory yeah. of the post-concert is that the following week um, or two weeks afterwards, he plays the Albert Hall and it's the front page of Melody Maker, the polka dot shirt. Um, um, uh, Dylan says he won't ever come back again. That England's had it, <laughs> it we're all it. squares. You, the <coughs> people think this is a drug song. It's not a drug song, it's a modern song. That's right. Um, and I thought, oh my God, you know, we've blown it. Dylan will never return. He's <laughs> never going to come back. Um, but then, as you, say, as you say, things ebb away. Mm. And then the next thing is, of course, Blonde on Blondes come out. That's uh, right. A couple that of months afterwards. Didn't. And that's it. You've got all those songs we that you heard. Were, yeah. You knew exactly what you were going to get. And it was, uh, it was another tearing away the scales from the eyes. Yes. Yeah. Or the ears, you know. This yeah. is the dumb yeah. Uh, we've landed right bang in the middle of that vision that he was trying to channel to us that night. Mm. Um, and I th well, you'd know best, Mike, because the, the, all the traditionalists that I knew, with by the end of that year, um, were very happy to listen to Tim Buckley. Or, well, um, I think everything was changing. Everything was changing very fast and new things were happening. And as you said, with the release of, of Blonde on Blonde, the stuff that... I would say we hadn't heard at the Free Trade Hall, we actually did here. Yeah. So it, it was it was like hearing it for the first time. The, the mm -hmm. concert was just a, a noisy evening that hadn't gone very well. But once you could actually hear the songs and know exactly what he was singing and it was, in a, it was mixed, then fantastic. After the Dylan gig here, it was happening to me. It, it wasn't happening because of Dylan or anything. It was happening to me. It made me go away and reassess my album collection. You know, uh, well, what's wrong with, you know, <laughs> a bit of electric music, you know, what's wrong with this? And to listen to the Dylan stuff that I already had with, uh, you know, with a band on it, mm. uh, and to realize, well, yeah. And then when it took another level and went into this electric thing, to me that was when it so it, it was like it broke the mold. To be honest, I don't, I yeah. still don't think I've seen anything that affected me because of my position at that time, how I felt. Okay, maybe naive at seventeen, well, eighteen, but it, it was it was a racket. It was a noise, and it but was, it was doing something. I, I forget yeah, the yeah. sound. I think I think the whole concert actually did something, broke some new territory. It, it was revolution. That it Dylan was, experiment, if you like, that transformed you, the Beatles from a pop group to a exactly. rock band. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You yeah. Know, it's, uh, yeah.
I think that's right. And, uh, and then through that, the Beach Boys, uh, you yeah. see the dominoes are falling. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, important is what happens afterwards with the, with the bike crash, and yeah. which enables yeah. him to yeah. stop. Because he's not just burning the candle at both ends; he's taking a blow. To it's almost a middle. fortunate accident that because I don't, Very, I don't yeah. think he would have made it if he'd have carried on. No, we'd be discussing a messianic figure mm. who produced five albums. Or went. Yeah. yeah, he needed that time out for three years. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it was an essential part of the Dylan myth or mythology that he does it, uh, but it had to be terminated by mm. something radical, which happened, and then. Uh, he reinvents himself as he does period. Well, when we picked it up, I mean, I went to the Isle of Wight, probably. Did you yeah, go to the Isle of Wight? I didn't go to the Isle of Wight, though. That was three years later, mm. almost. Well, three three years, two months, something like that. Felt like ten years. Yeah, because yeah. Oh, nobody yeah. had heard a word. Not a word. Yeah. People just couldn't believe he was still alive. There can be little doubt that the 1966 concert at the Free Trade Hall and the tour of which it was a part represented both a creative milestone in Dylan's career and a defining moment for those that attended. For some it was a juncture, a departure from pop and rock and roll into something more dark and challenging, perhaps even a moment that heralded the birth of rock as a distinctive genre. Crucially for some, the event set out a manifesto for the future. The musician artist as auteur, both ahead of and challenging the audience. Dylan paved the way for the artist as a driven, uncompromising, visceral and confrontational force.